Anything? Okay, cool. Come on up, Lisa. Um, anybody else a fan of His Girl Friday? They have serious chemistry in this movie, right? Yeah. Um, and in this movie, um, the, the Hildy, the character played by Rosalind Russell, she's a reporter, she meets a, a murderer, and she feels sorry for him. She wants him to be acquitted, and she wants to get a really good article out of it. So she argues passionately in the article she's writing that um, this man, who's not a brightest bulb was only using the gun because it was there and really it's the fault of the gun manufacturers that production for use is just the what he was following which is by the way political it's about communism at that time but um it's it's also a uh, it, it has layers and so um i thought of this when i was thinking about how when six years ago i was looking for software engineering practices and tools for data pipelines and um, I realized very quickly that people were telling me things like, you should use Pandas, you should use Jupyter, you should use Airflow, without asking me a single question about what kind of problem I had. And so, um, yeah, this data scorecard, by the way, that Jeff Koleski and I handed out earlier, Jeff is my co-author on the scorecard and on a library we're working on. Um, if you want to fill it out, and hand it back to us, that would be amazing data. We'd like to develop the scorecard and make it uh, a better scorecard and make it more useful and work it into more advice. Um, if you want to put your email on it, if we can uh, follow up with you and ask you more questions about your project, um, I would appreciate that. We might well get in touch with people. Um, anything else to add about that, Jeff? <laughs> um, I can also send out um, the, the, the uh, really non-serious one, which is the data purity test um, that I handed out at PyBay. Um, oh, and by the way, I've been introducing Jeff to Python, making him code in Python, and now I get to introduce him to this lovely community because I know that the Python community is wonderful. Um, what kind of scores did people get? Who got a complexity score? 10 ish, 20 ish, 30 ish, some 30s? And what scores did people get? You shout it out. 34. Vicky, I know you got a score. You, you, you thought. Oh, what did I hear over here? Did somebody get a score on the complexity side that they want to share? No. Um, what about the other side? What about the scale and ops side? Anybody get a score they want to share? Eight. The reason why I separated, why we separated scale and ops from complexity is because I think some tools that, that people want to advise you to use are really optimized towards fixing a scale problem. But if your scale score, your, if your scale challenges are low, but your complexity challenges are high, that might not be the right tool for you. Um, and I'm thinking about the sensitivity part as a different thing entirely. Um, maybe that's not even part of scale ops. It does make ops more complicated, but it's not really scaling. So I don't know if it needs its own score. I welcome feedback. Um, I, I would also love to know if you think that this scorecard didn't represent the complexity or the j difficulty, the challenge that you actually experienced in a data integration project. Um, think about it. Um, make a comment in the question section. That would be awesome. I'd love to learn more. So my hi hypothesis is that um, the tools we use are not only more or less fit to the problems we have, but also once we adopt tools, the engineers in our team adapt themselves to the tools, which can be um, which can make things worse sometimes. Rather than rather than adapting the tool to the situation, they adapt themselves to the tool, and if it's a, a bad fit, it makes the bad fit even worse. Um, and I I think I've I've seen a few of these cases. Um, so I'd like to get into a few of the tools. This is not a complete list of Python tools. 
uh, but it's ones that I researched or had enough familiarity with to feel I could say some things about. Your experience might be different. I'm also interested in hearing about that. But let's take uh, pandas, for example. Does pandas help you manage complexity? I thought all in all, yeah, it does. Yeah? Um, uh, in, in particular, uh, some things that are a lot of complex uh, Python code can be one-liners in pandas. Yeah, on the other hand, it's not very readable if, uh, depending on who wrote it. You can have a panda style. Um, I was at a talk, I, I enjoyed the talk very much. I learned a lot from it, but it, it, it um, uh, suggested a style for pandas, which was very like, what's it called, line continuation style, where you, you do this and then you dot and then you do the next thing and then dot and then you do the next thing. What's that called, is there a name? Chain, chaining? Yeah, sure. And I think chaining is actually really useful in, in some environments, but chaining in production code is a bad idea because it's really hard to change that code and test it. Um, so it depends on what, again, it depends on your project. Um, if you're exploring, chaining is great because as soon as you fix one thing, you run the whole chain again very idiomatic, idiomatically. And that's great. But if you're not in an exploration building mode, if you're in a maintaining mode, ouch. Does it aid with data scale? Um, it can present scaling challenges if you do the in-memory analytics, but some of it is portable to Spark, so that's awesome. It's gotten much more scalable if you consider Spark to be the scaling like iteration of Pandas. Yes, sir. Modem? Moden? M-O-D-I-N, thank you. Excellent, that's good to know. Does it aid you in automation? What if you have a data integration that you need to run daily, weekly, all the time? Yes, I think so. It's part of a wholesome unit testable code, code base is, is how I characterized it. You can write um, functions, steps, uh, get your pandas invocation just right. And maybe it doesn't even, Maybe it, it even fixes the readability problem because you might have some pandas code that's not very like English, but <laughs> you know natural language. But you call the function something sensible, and you write a good unit test for it, and suddenly you fix the readability problem, and you've made it really maintainable. You're practicing software engineering around that pandas invocation. So good. And anything you can automate tasks with Python, you can include pandas in that. So that's great. Uh, in summary, it's an excellent library. If you're not using it and you want to try it in a software engineering environment or in an experimental environment where you're just exploring data, go ahead. It's powerful. And just remember to use those, those good software engineering practices if you're, if you're going to have to, or if somebody else is going to have to maintain it. It's a gift to them, right? Jupiter, a little bit of a different fish. And here's where I saw the chaining style really successful. When you're opening a Jupyter notebook and you're chaining a bunch of panda stuff, great. Because then you um, find a flaw in your data you or, or a, a thing in your data that makes you find a flaw in your code and you fix that chained code and it all just runs again. The problem if you don't do chaining in Jupyter is that um, it's really easy. I've watched people mix up the steps in Jupyter. And so people get trained to use Jupyter and it is powerful and, you sh and it's really useful to know, but then try to bring it to an automation problem. Try to bring it to a software engineering problem. And once they've got a good notebook going and they've got like 30 lines, 15 of which are actually working, they're like, great, I solved this. The output is what I wanted it to be. And then next week, this um, you know, intelligent but um, inexperienced boot camp graduate, um, <laughs> I see this more than once, so I'll, but but the 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 stereotype, I don't know how how much the stereotype holds, but it holds for at least some. We'll get a new batch of data and try to bring it through the same notebook and change a few things because a few things are different. And uh, break a few other things and not notice it. And then the next week, another batch of code comes, another batch of data comes in and they try to open it up in the same notebook. Now, notice that this whole time nobody else can run that notebook. 
it's not getting more and more mature. It's not aiding in automation. And errors can reoccur. Regressions are really likely in this situation. This is not a good software engineering practice. If you're trying to do software engineering, get out of Jupiter when you have done your exploring. Yeah? Uh, has anybody used Django import export? No. Okay, Django import export. Who, who uses Django? Yeah, okay, a few. Um, I love working with an ORM. An ORM supports me being able to refactor and maintain my code base. If uh, we add features and I need to split a table into two, great. I will have Django write a migration for me. Um, if I need to make my own migration, I get in there and I write a little bit of extra code and everybody gets to run the same migration. So it, it supports software engineering, refactoring, maintainable code, uh, keeping your tech debt manageable, all of that stuff. Django import export. It, again, it's a, um, it's a healthy part of a, uh, software, of a software engineering environment. <laughs> um, it aids you in that by adding to your data model through a separate file. If you've got models.py with Django, you typically have resource.py with Django import export. And it gives you a uh, import and export format for that model. Um, and you can do clever things. Like if you have a model that's a fairly rich model, but it's got a couple of small joins to other tables. Like let's say you've got an employee table and the um, and it's got a table of email addresses that points to the employee table, but one of the email addresses is called main or something like that, but you want to keep them all. This is fine. You can have, you can write a DIE exporter that follows that foreign key in the right direction, gets the email address called main, puts it in a column called main e email address, and spits that out into your CSV. So it's a lot less dumb than a serializer. Uh, serializers are the ones that, you know, or picklers are the um, pieces of code that just spit out your data model. Uh, and sometimes you can customize them, but it's often not very readable. Django import export, when you have a resource file and you've declared what columns and what, what formats you want them in, is quite readable. It's very declarative. It looks a lot like a Django model. So it's, um, it goes along with so nicely. And it, 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 so it, it supports engineers. It, it guides them towards having a stable import export format. And guess what? Now you've really enhanced your ability to change your data model, to refactor your code. You have a table you want to split into um, two tables or columns you need to add. Your previous DIE import files, if you make them keep working, they keep working. This becomes a stable interface. Uh, it's a, it's a, a lot of extra work when people use serializers and then the code that they're, the, the data that they're trying to serialize from models, they try to use, but then they can't do migrations because that would break the old serialized data and they have to like stop everything and take a week to say no serializing until we uh, do this big migration. You don't want to do that because that makes migration so painful that it makes re refactoring painful and that makes tech debt accumulate more. So use a, instead of a dumb serializer, use an import export formatter that gives you a solid stable interface. You can change it when the situation calls for it, but you can also keep it remarkably stable even as you're changing stuff inside your data model. So does it aid with complexity? Absolutely. Um, it simplifies the Django model code, um, does a nice separation of concerns. Here's how you save to the database. Here's how you save to file. Here's how you transfer between them. Um, it has really useful diffs. So one of the ways that um, it helps with complexity is it, it will integrate with the Django admin. And when you import a file, it will say, are these the changes you wanted to make to these records? And show added values in green and deleted values in red. And so many times in my uh, last startup, these diffs saved us from uh, making an error. Like we'll import something and go like, wait a minute, 
this import is changing every employee ID in an entire customer. I think something went wrong there. Or if that's right, we have other work to do. <laughs> and you notice that in the diffs. The diffs are wonderful. So I, I say that that helps with complexity also. Um, it's testable. You can use DIE uh, resources in unit tests. You can unit test the resources themselves. Um, you can plug them into automation. So it does help with automation. You can call, we had an employee model, we had an employee resource. We can call the employee resource in automation. Any script that can call our Django environment could call our employee resource and spit out a CSV for a company or for the whole table. Um, one caveat I had was that it is not good at containing a pipeline. It is meant to be very declarative and very fairly close to your database model. So if you have data coming in that requires a lot of enrichment, of transformations, of doing calculations, and you try to do that inside a DIE uh, resource, that would be very painful because the programmers were clearly very clever people who loved abstraction and loved hiding things from the user. And um, <laughs> I can tell how clever they are, <laughs> and yet it is hard to do things because it just swallows problems and just does things for you, or, or goes on without doing things for you and doesn't tell you. So it is hard to do complicated things in. Still, when used for that last step of I.O. Um, into your models, it, is, it, it still can be used very successfully to help with complexity. Uh, does anybody use Dagster? No. Um, does anybody use Airflow or there's an, another couple of Dag things out there? Yeah. I don't know how similar they all are. I researched Dagster because it's a Python thing and because when I said I have this data complexity problem, people said, oh, you need to use Dags. Um, I think it simplifies complex operations situations. Like when you have um, data coming in through a file drop and you want to enrich that with some configuration data somewhere and a database over here and you're trying to, to draw all these different things together in an online system, yes, I think these can simplify complexity. But that's only one kind of complexity and I don't even know how to, how to characterize this to ask people what kind of complexity they have so the scorecard doesn't really get into this. What about when you just have complexity of logic? You, you have a bunch of files, the data's all there, maybe files in one database, but you have uh, you know, hundreds of lines of logic to do calculations, to clean data, to handle uh, you know, checking valid values, to handle exceptions, to handle this customer's um, names the column this, this customer names the column that, this field you have to split into two, um, what to do with currency values, all of that stuff. Once your software, once your, your, your Python code gets complex, I don't think this helps much. You could put every step you can conceive of into a DAG node, and then their, uh, your DAG becomes insane, if you're me, uh, <laughs> in the problem I had in my last startup. Um, or you could just put it all inside one big DAG step and run it there, which might have helped the situation operationally, but again, it doesn't help with the code inside that, that, that box of here's the transformations we're doing before we are ready to load it into the database. Did I catch my own notes on this? It, I always have, I'm a real skeptic about adopting software, as you can probably start to gather. I, uh, one of the things I look at is I'll be much more likely to adopt something like Pandas that doesn't have an operational lift than something that does. And all the DAG things I looked at have a real operational li lift. And the risk is that you'll uh, end up with specialists. You'll ha end up having a DAGster specialist and nobody else really knows how to maintain it or why it was or organized the way it was. And you've uh, tried to simplify, you've tried to help with your complexity, but you've accidentally added to it. So we never did adopt Airflow or Dagster. I do know people who did adopt Airflow successfully and use it and are happy with it. I, I think that it, it, it would benefit this community to, to talk a with a little bit more nuance about when, when that is the right tool.
Yeah. Yeah. I think you need an ops team before you need Dagster. DBT. Anybody use DBT? Yeah, a couple. I would love to know if I'm wrong about this. Again, this is something I researched and did not use. Um, does it aid with complexity? And these are my hypotheses. My hypothesis is it does encourage you to break down high-level tasks into smaller components, which is always a good software engineering uh, practice. Um, and it used to be until recently that all of your pipeline stuff had to be in one DBT project which did not aid with complexity because if you have multiple teams working on different pipelines they all had to like sort of be careful about not treading on each other's toes according to the research and the posts i've seen but recently dbt has mesh features to allow with that to, to help help you work with that again it's a whole platform and an ops commitment and the thing that really offended me i'm offended is that it was so not unit testable it works at the level of SQL queries. And so while you can run Python, it really encourages, oh, just, just put a SQL statement here in this step, and put a SQL statement here in this step, put a SQL statement here in this step. I, I would, you know, by using that in a, the project I worked on for the last six years, would lose all ability to, to migrate the data model because you have these unknown uninvestigatable sql queries out there like uh, how do uh, i yeah you 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 start to pile up technical debt the instant you start to do this um i tried to put a, a, a strengths in here again this is just research but according to partly the marketing um <laughs> dbt strengths are in making data flows accessible to non-engineers and scaling batch and stream data. I would hope it, was be, it would be used in simple but large scale data tasks. When you're dealing with lots and lots of log files, lots and lots of records that are each of them simple, where there's not a lot of joins, where there's not a lot of validation, where there's not a lot of like overwriting existing records, but only if the new record is valid and logic like that. Um, and there are lots of tools that help data scale. I don't think, it's, computers have gotten so powerful, a lot of us can do a lot of problems without worry, really worrying about scale. We should use the tools that make us more productive and happy engineers. For me, that's the software engineering practices, as you can tell, of unit testing, CI, migrations, uh, good uh, and not dumb serializers, you know, strong interfaces, good componentization, information hiding, as my um, software engineering professor <laughs> we used to say 30 years ago. It, it the the tools that make us uh, more effective engineers often do so much more for performance than the tools that are supposed to help you with performance because as effective engineers we can maintain our understanding of the system and do things that are more sensible to begin with rather than trying to do performance optimizations on things that aren't really sensible to begin with but we're stuck with them because of all these sql queries out here Um, another complexity problem that's a little different is when you have a whole bunch of APIs to deal with, especially if they're public APIs, uh, the specific tools to deal with that are API connector libraries. So those can be useful. Um, that's the end of the tools I researched or had strong opinions about. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to questions, uh, suggestions if people want to talk about a tool that um, maybe has Oh, I have one more slide. And then, did you want to say something about what it's Well, I was, just, I was wondering when you, actually in the previous one, you talked about batch processing and avoid batch processing and you had queues. I was trying to figure out if you, what you were, are you saying to use more event driven or are you saying something different? Um, that if you're scaling, if you're purely scaling the number of records, try to deal with the records one by one if you can because then you're dealing then you can deal with throughput and not also with memory things at the same time um did I say, yeah oh so other things to prioritize are um figuring out how to scale your team size 
that's something that the to tools tend not to tell you what is, what is good or bad. Like all the software out there, the sales teams, they want you to think that their tool is good for any size team. Um, some tools help you have more engineers contribute. Some tools um, specialize knowledge and limit control to a very small number of people, sometimes just one. That's a problem. Um, one of the reasons why we continued using spreadsheets in my last company, despite our, our rigor and care about getting the data right and having everything unit testable, we still supported looking at the data in a spreadsheet, modifying it if necessary, and returning it to the system. Um, despite all the problems that James pointed out and others besides, like the magic character that Excel puts at the beginning of a CSV sometimes that you have to strip out or it doesn't parse as valid Unicode, we still used spreadsheets because it allowed our team to scale. It allowed the customer success people to say like, oh, well, I'll just open up the CSV, fix it, and we'll unblock the customer. And the data engineer now has weeks in which to go and add that exception to the code. Instead of, uh, you know, paging the engineer, we never paged an engineer at midnight. <laughs> we never paged an engineer between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. while running uh, 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 raise cycles for our customers at my, at my last startup. So um, allowing the people, the frontline people to help you with data turns out to be an, a really interesting scaling problem that, you know, most people don't think about when they think about scaling. Um, another thing um, I like to think about when I said I have skepticism about bringing in new tools is that if I need an ops person to do something, I have just added a whole nother person to a team. My team never got larger than 10 at the last, at this, 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 startup that did employee and uh, comp data. Um, so can you scale this tool down to small tools, to, to small teams this is an important question. Um, what about achieving compliance? That is something I was hinting at in the scorecard. If you have a big sensitivity score, a big compliance score, then there are tools to help you with that. Um, conversely, um, can you just use tools to document things um, and, and document them for compliance and automate some of your compliance? That's another thing. Uh, scaling your com your compliance work or if making cons uh, making the efficiency of your compliance work a concern can really help your entire team when it's when it's small. And my last really general principle to remind people of is dividing and conquering. If you have multiple kinds of complexity. Can you divide that out? Can you say, this part of the problem, we're going to deal with record by record, and we're going to send it through a queue, and we're going to put it in a, a NoSQL database, but this part of the problem, we're going to look at CSVs and, and have checkpoints of all of the changes we make, and that system is going to have software engineering applied to it. It's going to have unit tests and CI. Can you divide up your problem? Even if it's sort of all part of the same problem, when you can divide by what challenges the section of the problem has and actually address them differently, that can be a massive win because then you're not trying to find a one size fits all tool for all the different parts of your challenging situation. Um, the last slide just has some uh, names and links. So yes, I'm opening up to questions, suggestions, recommendations.